message after the tone. John, Mike Donovan here. I want you to stop working on the missing person story. I got a call from the CBS and a bunch of other organizations looking to sue us if we print. Just let it go, John. I'll talk to you later. This is the last time, John. If I hear you're still working on that story, you're out of here. I warned you, John. Look, I'm sorry. I gotta let you go. Be careful, John. In the United States, close to a million missing person reports are filed every year. Whilst many of those reports are filed as protocol, quickly resolved and closed down, a worrying percentage of those are never even investigated. As I began my investigation, it quickly became apparent that there was a disturbing nature to these disappearances. And as I pursued each lead, I found myself embroiled in something I could never have expected. Little did I know that I would be contacted by a very covert, secretive individual who would blow the lid off what many of us believe to be the truth about our world. As you are reading this, you will not yet understand the very taboo nature of what we're dealing with. I look at the um, alternative media, as it's called, which is where a film like this would come out of. Obviously, it wouldn't come out of the mainstream. And what's developed um, over the years that this alternative media has um, has come into being. What's developed is the alternative mainstream. And almost everyone has a here and no further point. And just because you are aware that there's a banking scam and a political scam and engineered wars, doesn't mean that your mind is open to the, the, the deep, deep, deep in the rabbit hole um, areas that will explain where all that's actually ultimately coming from. You will have um, people who will go so far, but then their belief system, their sense of credulity, will say here and no further. Well, I think it's like a kind of a human archetype. Unless you're a small boy with frogs in your pocket, people don't like toads or snakes or crocodiles or alligators. Dragons sometimes are shown as friendly, often are shown as uh, dangerous and fire-breathing and nasty and they've got little eyes and they are, they are inhuman. Um, they've got little slitty eyes and somehow there's a part of that that doesn't resonate with us. To think that reptilians even exist, let alone that they're in some way controlling the populace and what's going on, just seems so far out there to the normal person with their programming and their paradigm and, and that type of thing. So I think it's just out, out, out of the realm of belief for them, just through their programming. The idea that life as we know it has, has only um, developed in, on this one planet, in this one slither of frequency, is ridiculous. But the human perception has been so programmed with um, limitation, with a sense of I can't, 
the sense of it cannot be that it's left to very few compared with the global population to explore beyond that sense of can be and that's why these films are not made in greater abundance creatures with large heads with with fur and big eyes um, like the traditional puppy dog pictures that make us go ah oh, look isn't that cute one doesn't look at a reptile and think ah oh, isn't that cute that that basic human empathy just just isn't there what I do is I open my mind and I let the information be my guide and and that decides where I go uh, not preconceived idea and unfortunately um, preconceived idea belief whatever that may be is the prison cell for most people and that's why they don't go beyond it I think there's a lot of ego involved in this in, in this subject as there are in a lot of others and, and the, that type of ego is, is infected ego as far as I'm concerned it's, um, and, and the last thing these entities want is to be noticed, they want to be ignored because if they're ignored they can get away with it you see so you want to infect people and let them think that there's no such thing and actually try and spread that there's no such thing so that these, pe these things can operate in the darkness. This is programming, and David Icke talks about this, a societal programming wherein we are conditioned to hate and fear this subject so much that without something extra, without something more unusual happening to us to cause us to search for this darker truth, people will be inclined not to see it even if it's right in front of their face which is what I've experienced and even people in my own family and people that I know very well and people who were interested in ufology when they saw this either didn't see it or became very upset about it. In the early 90s when we were first learning about the reptilians you tended to hear about cases of, of rape and uh, situations like that and uh, almost like an instinctive fear that some people had in response to just being in their presence, just like a uh, phys physiological reaction uh, to them. Uh, so I think all of those factors, plus the bad reputation of snakes in Judeo-Christian mythology, uh, has given them sort of a bad reputation. Uh, and that led to maybe a, a bit of a taboo in discussing them. Uh, but. I don't think that uh, the taboo is really necessary. The gentleman I will call X in this article has always refused to give me his name. Of course that was highly suspicious, but he was giving me important and in some cases classified information. I felt compelled to continue my investigation, even though I knew what I was doing was very dangerous. I never really questioned the validity of what he was telling me. Somehow I knew it was the truth, no matter how uncomfortable that made me feel. Sometimes X handed me documents, photographs, or newspaper articles to follow up. Other times he would drop a name into a conversation, only giving me pieces of the puzzle. John, I can't just tell you what's going on. Those are the rules. You have to research this information yourself. I can give you places to look, people to see. Look up the work of Professor John Mack. It was a synchronous uh, event in the sense that I think anyone knows what I mean is that you find out something just prior to experiencing it. And I'd read a couple of books a couple of months before. One of them was Dr. John Mack, the, uh, the book Abduction. Now, Dr. John Mack, some may, uh, viewers may know, is uh, a gentleman who was a university professor of psychiatry at Harvard University. He was exposed to quite a, a number of people with experiences. He was a skeptic, did all the psychological testing, and he finally, in his two books, was firmly in the conclusion that these were real. These were real extraterrestrial encounters. I also read the book Communion, which is a classic with Whitley Strieber, talking about an author again of sci-fi um, fiction, who also said he'd had experiences. But the first person that came through my door that said, Mary, I've heard you're open-minded, is a gentleman called Ellis Taylor. 
and Ellis came to me via a friend and the friend had told him I was open-minded so he came to me really wanting to tell me about something he said Mary there's no support groups for this for this they just think you're a loony and here I had a middle-aged very articulate gentleman who was telling me quite normally that this is what was happening to him that he was aware he was being taken up on spacecraft that he was waking up with shaved areas on his, his body other marks on his body his whole family were affected that was his partner and the children he talked about going through walls and he said no one would come to the house because they thought it was demons on the 13th of april in 1996 i got up about seven o'clock in the morning went to the loo came back to bed my partner went with the covers off me what's all that all over your body and I had all these marks on my body and I couldn't quite make them out but she was really freaking out and um, there was a face there, drawing of a face, there was like something there that looked like a tail or maybe a paw or something that I didn't quite, couldn't quite make out and there were finger marks here that were in a strange configuration um, and they were all red marks and none of them had any impression, they just completely smooth and um, yeah and I, then I was burnt all the way around as well all around the rest of my body, like bright red my partner as I said was freaking out she rushed to the, get her camera and came back and started taking photographs of them and um, meanwhile I looked in the mirror because I couldn't quite see what they were and I could see what she was talking about because it's very distinct, these things. And um, she took photographs of them and very shortly after that, they vanished. Part of it is, the three questions they ask me is, am I going crazy? Is this real? And if it's real, why me? Three cru crucial questions. And so it was okay, Mary, you better find out whether this really is real or whether a lot of people are just having a very, very interesting, unusual experience that, you know, is, is more, um, well, they believe it's real, is, is the favorite, oh, well, if they believe it's real, then it's real to them, which is the biggest cop-out you can ever get. I started having experiences with greys, um, 2012 and 13 like mid-2012 and it's continued now but up to 2013 were major things that had happened and I sort of got like flashbacks of seeing certain, some of these beings and then I started to remember I used to see beings in my mum's house and my stepfather's house between the ages of 8 and 12 which is the time that I was in this particular house with my brother who also has had experiences but I didn't see him as demonic, I didn't see them as angels, I didn't even see them as good or bad, I didn't have no reference for what I was seeing, but I never really talked about, I never talked about it full stop, it was sort of like, oh, here's something weird, and I'd pull up the sheet out of my head and just hope that whatever it was would go away, so, yeah, it goes back a fair way. Um, I'd contacted a lot of people for support, or just to talk to about what was going on, because I was in the thick of it. Mary was the first one to respond. Um, what got me with Mary was, and later looking back especially, I could see how her intent for helping me out was pure and it wasn't about showcasing me, it was all about me, support for me, my health, my well-being, um, and just to, you know, keep me grounded was the main thing that I needed. Um, she's been there, again, since day dot. She's always there for me to talk to, no matter what about, how far out. As she says, the more weirder, the more wonderful for her. Um, and I'm for forever appreciative uh, for her being in my life, just like many of us. And um, our friendship continues to grow, and it's gone in some weird and wonderful directions that I didn't expect. So, yeah, she's a lovely lady, and I've forever been indebted to her. What I was amazed to discover was many of those that had this experience. One, when they began to understand it, often their fear went. And often it's the fear of the unknown than what actually happened. And so I had to isolate, is it the, what actually happens that scares them or is it the fact that they don't know what's happened? So that's two separate things. So 
in my whole panorama of those having experience, for example, only maybe 25 to 30 percent are actually traumatized. And what amazed me, there were people eventually coming to me, and this is where I had to broaden my questionnaire, that saying, look, Mary, we're not frightened of the ETs. In fact, we, we think they're family. What scares us is being on a planet with humans that are so barbaric, they still kill one another when they have a disagreement. It's actually really hard here because I know I come from a place where we don't do things like that. I feel like I've been dumped on a primitive planet. I don't like it. I've, I've always felt isolated. I feel like I've been adopted in my own family. I don't even feel like I connect to them. I feel like my family has, you know, I've got something to do here and this is why I'm here. And these I call the star seeds or star kids because their real connection is actually to the, those intelligences out there that actually the human beings that they're operating or, or um, sharing their environment with. So, it, you know, in, in that sense, this is a huge, huge um, panorama of experience where some are terrified of the beings and some actually think the beings are family. So, you, you know, um, where do you go with that? Well, you know, only recently I had a young woman tell me that she was a hybrid and that she believed that she was part human, part reptilian, for example. So for her, what was hard was being in a human body when she related much to her, uh, her reptilian soul, if you like. That's how she saw it. Others believe that their, their soul is an, um, from a mantid, which is an insect-like being, some the felines, the cat being, for example. They say their origins are from those places. So they relate to that particular form. And if you have an eight-year-old that tells you that their family is a mantid, this is an insect-like being, that's his family. His human family is here to look after him and he loves them, but that's his family. And when he dies, that's where he's going, to his, uh, his ancestral family, which is the mantid insect-like being. And he gets quite emotional about it. This is an eight-year-old getting emotional about going back to his origins. It's very profound. Um, and you've, you've got others that believe they're a mix. And, you know, um, Simon Parks is one of those because I was able with um, this young boy, which I'll call Paul, and Simon Parks, I was actually interacting with both of them at similar times, although one's in the Northern Hemisphere, one is in the Southern Hemisphere. They never spoke to one another, but I was able to get information to look for corroboration. And Simon Parks believes his mother is a mantid, although he also connects to the cat feline beings and to the reptilians. But he feels most connected to the mantid. And he talks about going into his mantid form on the spacecraft and working with humans. And when I spoke to this little eight-year-old, he described it in this way that he evaporated into his mantid form and would operate as a mantid and then come back into his human form. So here is a little boy talking about a soul transfer. One of the questions that pretty much all experiencers ask themselves at some point is, why me? You know, another one is, am I going crazy? But uh, eventually they figure out that they're not crazy. Uh, that whatever they're experiencing, they're still functioning, and, and uh, it's not, you know, it's not a, a form of uh, any anything. You know, John Mack certainly was not who's, you know, uh, was not able to identify it as any kind of psychological pathology. Uh, so they ask, why me? Oh, why is this happening to me? And well, we know that the abduction phenomenon does run in families, and the same thing seems to be true for reptilian contact. Uh, so you can look at reptilian contact as a facet of the UFO abduction phenomenon, uh, and it suggests a genetic aspect to their interest in us. But, you know, in addition to following family lines, uh, there's more to it. A number of reptilian contactees have actually recalled memories of having a past life as a reptilian. And, you know, it doesn't appear that people are chosen at random out of the human population, 
One abductee, one reptilian contactee described to me uh, what she calls multidimensional simultaneous existence uh, because that time, basically, if you look into physics, uh, ideas like the relativity of simultaneity and the concept of space-time, turns out that everything is happening now. Uh, including past and future events. Everything is really happening all at the same time. So past lives and future lives exist now. So what in reincarnation traditionally we'd think of as past lives, well, if you think of it as simultaneous multidimensional existence, those are really parallel lives. And uh, there are situations, for instance, in dreaming where consciousness can move from one of these parallel lives to another. Uh, and that, you know, that is, explains why there is a connection between us uh, and these other lives that we're living as reptilians. And it explains why some of the interactions go on. My first experience that I'm aware of was when I was either four or five years old in, in Texas, uh, where I encountered uh, a brown being that was levitating in my bedroom and it had round eyes, kind of a wrinkled face. If the viewer looks up the book Alien Jigsaw 2, uh, the researcher supplement, I think it's called, by Katerina Wilson, she has a drawing in there of a being she describes as a type 2 gray. Uh, and that's pretty much what I saw, except it wasn't gray, it was brownish. And that was the first consciously remembered ex actually it wasn't conscious it, i i remembered it consciously for many years and as is the case of many other abductees suddenly i reached a certain age where i just forgot all about it but prior to that i was telling everyone i could about it right but then a point came in time where it was wiped from my conscious memory years later after i moved to san diego and became a member of the san diego ufo society i had a hypnotic regression uh, about some of my experiences and although nothing new came up what happened was my subconscious was kind of jarred and shaken around a bit because uh, like a day or two after I had that what I thought was an unsuccessful hypnotic regression I was reading a book called uh, Project Omega UFOs, NDEs, and the Mind at Large by Dr. Kenneth Ring, if memory serves. And at the end of that book, he has a questionnaire to determine if someone has had alien abduction experiences or not. And I basically answered yes to like 17 out of 22. And uh, I got triggered when I had one question, when I read one question that, that asked, as a child, do you recall having experiences with little people or little friends that no one else could see and then just as soon as I finished reading that question bang that memory of when I was in Texas when I was four or five years old came back when I came back from Germany in 1990 I had a series of UFO experiences and abduction experiences culminating in a uh, abduction full, con full waking consciousness at night uh, when those three reptilian greys came and they took me uh, they took me up into their ship and they put me on a, a examining table and they did all this other stuff to me uh, and that was just one of a series of events and then I was frustrated living in in the San Francisco Bay Area because I had no one to talk to about these experiences so when I moved to San Diego and joined the San Diego UFO Society suddenly I I could talk to other people about it. I can even talk to others who've had similar experiences. So it, it was uh, a simple transition for me to become a researcher because what I realized in my studies was after I had that full waking consciousness experience in September of 1990, when I came back from Germany, I immediately started researching the subject uh, in earnest. Now, I'd always been interested in the subject always been interested in Bigfoot, the Bermuda Triangle, other dimensions, so on and so forth. That was stuff I took for granted, including the subject of UFOs. But I, th there was an element of me for years that was kind of scared of the UFO subject. There was something about the subject that, that gave me the creeps that didn't uh, 
that I couldn't quite understand and that, that gave me you know, a certain degree of fear. Like when I was in high school, for example, I would see beams of light, bluish white light come in through the ceiling and do a search pattern on the floor. Uh, I had a, a lot of experiences where I was taken out of my body astrally and uh, I've since come to find out that a lot of these experiences happen in, in our astral state because these beings have the means to trigger uh, uh, an out-of-body experience within us. It's a multifaceted experience. It's not just physical abductions, it's, it's astral experiences, it's what's been described as dream hacking or astral dreamscape manipulation, telepathic uh, experiences, so on and so forth. When an alien creature of any sort interacts with a human, nine times out of 10 or 9.999 times out of 10, that human is going to be terrified of this creature. There is no long association with these creatures. They cannot appear as they look because the human will just freak out and whatever the purpose that they've come to that per person for, they won't be able to do it. So they will come in disguise. Uh, and they don't physically change their body, they go into the mind of the human, and in the human's mind, they change. Now, because of my very long association with these creatures, they don't need to do that now. In the early days, they did, when I was a very small child. But also, it was a part of me um, accepting them for what they were. So as a, a five-year-old, or even, you know, 1963, as a three-and-a-half-year-old child, and was shown exactly what they looked like. And did freak me out, of course it did. But, you know, it, if you take a child that's three and stick it on an aeroplane and fly it from, I don't know, Birmingham Airport to London Airport, by the time that kid's 10, it will go from Heathrow to JFK with no worries because it knows no different. If these creatures don't harm you, you have no reason to be scared of them. So it means that my perceptions are going to be more accurate than somebody who's, who's half scared out of their mind, has their body frozen and can't move. So no, um, there are shadow creatures that are genuinely shadow beings. There are jinn that can appear like shadow creatures. And all of the entities that we're discussing have the ability to go into a human's mind and make that human think they're seeing anything. And that's why Adolf Hitler got Dr. Mengele back in the late 30s to attempt to do to, to work on humans that would prevent aliens from gaining control of their mind. And this is when Mengele just went completely off on his own tangent and ended up working for the Illuminati in America. But it originally stems from Hitler saying, because he was in, in contact with the older Baron off-world group, how can we have soldiers who can prevent all the information being taken out of their mind by these aliens. So that's where all this, this research started from. This is what totally scared the Yanks. So um, for most people who have an alien experience, they really don't know what they're seeing because they can only see with their eyes and believe what's happened to them. When you have an association with these creatures, and I can't be the only one, but when you have a long association with them, you have certain agreements, and these creatures are not, um, are not permitted to deceive me. Um, and I say I'm 54 now, and they haven't, they haven't, they are, I haven't lied to me yet, or I haven't caught them out yet. So they're either incredibly good liars, um, but when I ask a straight question, I usually get an answer, or they will refuse to answer rather than give me a lie. The revelation that the ever-growing missing persons reports were somehow connected to alien abduction phenomenon seemed ludicrous to me. There was something inside of me, an inert feeling to repel the information, and I didn't know why. As a researcher and journalist, it is built into my psyche to question everything I'm told. When I raised my doubts about this one evening in a taped conversation with X, I could never have prepared myself for what happened. Sorry, but I can't have you screaming like a little girl, so you've got to promise me you'll be quiet. If I wanted to harm you, you would be harmed. John, please, sit.
You needed a reason to take this further and I just gave it you. When I did this, I put both of us in danger. People like you don't need people like me unless it's important. We consider you important, John. You're not special. You're not the chosen one. You're not the savior. But you're a hell of a journalist, which is good for us. Bad for you. What, you think this story was your idea? We needed to trigger you. That's what we do, John. We poke you, prod you, coerce you, make you do things we can't. Well, not openly anyway. For now, just know, some of us are trying to help. You got a friend in me. I was in America uh, on a speaking tour. I say a speaking tour. In those days, um, a speaking tour largely meant talking to myself. <laughs> you know, I mean, I went to Chicago and spoke to eight people, um, um, or near Chicago anyway. Um, but on that speaking tour, over a period of uh, about 15 days, I met 12 separate people, and I was going to a different place every day, um, who told me the same basic story, how they'd seen uh, humans um, turn into a reptilian um, form and then back again. And it was uh, such a common theme that they were describing that I, I started exploring from, from that time. So it came into my life very quickly. I'd had it kind of heard like little mentions of it before and, and just let it go. But in this um, 15 day period that really focused my mind so there's something to look at here. When you, 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 you're faced with that situation with um, or, you know, one person after another in different parts of America telling you um, the same thing, you can either go, I'm not going there, what will people say if I start talking about this stuff? Or you can say, information's my guide, I'm going there. And what then happened is um, I came back from there to the Isle of Wight and, and I was meeting someone, actually not very far from here, who had uh, been married to a Satanist uh, who had been the warden for Burnham Beaches. Burnham Beaches, uh, out west uh, of London, is owned by the city of London, the financial district. And um, it is a, a, a big place of um, Satanism and very strange happenings. It's uh, wooded copses and... and, and, and um, and um, few open areas. And she asked to meet me because I, um, what I was writing about, uh, because she wanted to tell me about the Satanism which she experienced. And she told me uh, when I met her about um, seeing um, Ted Heath, former Prime Minister of Britain, took us into the European Union, um, doing a satanic ritual at Burnham Beaches because she lived there in, in the warden's house. And when this conversation was finished and I, you know, I, was, I was having a cup of tea and um, um, I, I was just finished my tea and I was putting it down and turning to go and I just said to her as a throwaway line, you know, I've, I've just come back from America and I met all these people that kept telling me um, how they'd seen people turn into reptiles and I heard her first and I turned around she's going oh my god oh my god I wasn't going to tell you about that she said what happened was she she saw lights and she took the dog out um, that night and and then she she went through and looked through the trees at this this light and she saw um, Heath um, in this circle and she said what she then saw was Heath shift into a reptilian form and grow about two feet, which is absolutely common in descriptions of this um, all over the world. And she said he started speaking then um, in a voice a bit like, she described it as a bit like the old transatlantic telephone uh, conversations when there was gaps. 
And she said the thing that shocked her more than anything else is that when this happened, no one in the circle moved in any way that related to shock or surprise. It, was, it seemed to them the most common thing, the most uh, common thing you could imagine. And from the, the American experience, and that lady too, um, then the synchronicity of my life started bringing more and more information in about it and more and more people with experiences about it. And that, that's been the way my life has gone in the last 25 years. A subject will come out of nowhere into my life and then suddenly, bang, information about that subject's coming from everywhere. And that's, that's what happened with the, with the reptilian thing. There's a lot of people out there who are under the misapprehension that somehow all of this is promulgated by David Icke and nobody else. And this is absolutely not true. I was once uh, privileged to sit at a dinner table with David Icke and Jordan Maxwell. David was on one side, Jordan was the other, and they started telling stories to each other. And I had a dictaphone in my pocket. Uh, here's a, a piece of advice to any would-be journalist here who happen to be watching this. Always have a dictaphone in your pocket. You never know when it's going to be useful to you. So I, I asked their permission, I put the dictaphone on the table, and then they were exchanging anecdotes with each other about reptilians, like a tennis match. It was fascinating. And I'll just give a couple of those because they are, they're, they're more than interesting. I'll start with Jordan's story. I'll condense this as best I can. He was told this story by a grown woman who he knew personally about her experience when she was a small girl. And she came from an Air Force family and lived on a military base. And her father had the kind of job such that when the phone rang, sometimes he had 10 minutes to leave the house with a, with a, with a packed bag and he might not be back for a couple of weeks. And whenever that happened, um, the protocol was that she would not be in the house alone for any reason and on this one occasion she begged her father to be left in the house she said well I'm a big girl now I can take care of myself there's nothing to worry about and her father demurred and so there were guards on the outside of the house and this was inside a secure installation and so there didn't really seem to be a problem she was in the house on her own she was a young girl she was uh, 11 or 12 years old or something like that and the story that she reports was this she said that a reptilian being a large reptilian being emerged from the walk-in closet the reptilian being was so tall that it had to duck to get out of the door of the walk-in closet and as this little girl froze in terror this creature floated across the floor towards her, didn't actually touch the ground. It clearly had um, had designs on something that didn't seem to be very welcome to her. She ran to the bathroom, she locked herself in the bathroom, and she screamed and screamed and screamed as this creature clawed on the outside of the door. And then finally, the guards heard her who were, who, were, who were outside the house. They came rushing in. This was their job, and this creature disappeared. And the claw marks were visible on the outside of the door. When her father got back, she said, this is why you must never be in the house alone. And it's interesting because her father didn't even seem particularly astonished by what had happened. It was like this was one of the things that was known could happen. Go figure. This was told by, told by this grown woman to Jordan Maxwell um, 20, 30 years later after this had all happened to her. I have this sense that I've known them all my life, or known who they are all my life. But, <coughs> and I can remember past life stuff with dragons and things like that, okay? Which is not exactly the same thing, I know. But this particular time, it was during a 47-day experience that included that 13th of April thing. 
47 days it went on for right? Night after night, day after day, left with patterns and marks and finger marks and all sorts of things going on. Um, but during that time, I was sitting in the lounge and um, I wanted to go to the loo. And to get from the lounge to the loo, you had to pass through the corner of the kitchen. There's a door, door here and then you went through a door there. As I went through that door there, just going to go into that door there, there's a reptilian standing there. It was tall. I mean, I didn't have my tape measure on me or anything, but it was, <laughs> it was a lot taller than me. And it was crouched like that. It, it was green. It had these kind of orangey slit eyes. It had a paler chest. It had like ridges and scales. But the thing about it was that it looked at me and what I felt was from him was, oh shit, it's in me. <laughs> I, it was more kind of worried that I'd seen it than, any, than having any kind of negative intent towards me or whatsoever. And I'm on the move, you see, when I see this and I'm just going to step into the hallway to go to the loo. And as I saw it, I, I was in mid-flight, so I didn't, couldn't stop immediately, so I went like that, came back and it had gone. And, but the whole room was not the room. It was standing in the corner of the room, where the corner of the room should have been, but the room wasn't there. It was another dimension in, in you know, I, I'd walked through another dimension. Um, I've had three experiences with the reptilians personally. Um, the first one was uh, late 2012. Um, I was at home and I started to vibrate and get this ringing in my ears. Um, and I was laying on the couch listening to the radio and it got to a certain point where I had like, my eyes were closed at the time, I had a flash. At that time, I, I sat up and stood up, and I was still vibrating, the ears were ringing, and all of a sudden, I just got engulfed with white light, and I appeared in this this cave, is the only way I can put it, and it was like a yellowish, orange rock all around me. And right in front of me was what I thought, perceived straight away, was a lizard man, because I still hadn't, at this time, checked up on reptilians. I heard about it, I thought, oh, who knows, you know. And um, it was a yellowish brown colour, they were about 6'2", six, 6'3", six, there was three of them, two of them that were directly in front of me were about 6'2", six, 6'3", six, around the same height, and there was a small one about 5'5", five five. and it was the same, they had these things protruding from here, the eyes, the nose was a bit down, and the stockier, and they were stocky, like muscly, stocky looking dudes. Um, at that point, um, basically the main frame of what had happened was I was asked, I was told by the reptilian in front of me that um, they're breaking up to factions basically and that they want ascension to this group. And I'm just thinking, why are you telling me? And they said, oh, well, this particular being in front of me said, because we want you to tell your people, like, put it in your book. And I, and I was writing Operation Star Seed at the time and I'm just thinking, this is just what, at this time, like, while this is going on too to my left, about 50 metres in the distance, and this cave would have been a few hectares big, like a city block or something big, but it was, I couldn't see any entrances, I'm assuming down further to my left, there was an entrance because there was a flying saucer with a, with a grey walking around it, and it had a bigger, bigger head than the normal ones I had seen before. So this is, while that's going on, that's going on 50 metres away to my left, and to my right, I noticed like a screen, it was like five metres by five metres, I assume. That was the diameter. And it, it was like a flat screen. If I looked at it, I didn't see anything. But if I looked at it in my peripheral vision, I could actually see a 3D hologram of the Earth coming out of it. And what I assume was um, fault lines and earthquakes, zones and that, that, that were sort of marked out on it. Um, I won't go particularly to 
what colours I saw on it and stuff because that's just a little thing that I've kept for me, you know, people ask me. Um, at around that time, a white light engulfed me again and I appeared back at home in the lounge room standing where I'd been previously. In the high desert of Southern California, uh, me and uh, our team were doing what we call reptilian stakeouts. Uh, one of our friends, a, a female my lab, uh, in the high desert of Southern California in the Victorville Barstow area, was having frequent reptilian experiences. Uh, the reptilians uh, were entering the house through a number of portal entries, one of which was in the uh, children's bedroom. And this goes back to the lore about the boogeyman coming out of wardrobes, coming out of closets. Uh, th this is the basis for that, is that these entities, not just reptilians but other beings, they create these interdimensional energetic portal entries which allows them, whether they're in our plane of existence in an, or in an, from another dimension or hovering in some spacecraft somewhere, they enter through these portal entries. And in the children's bedroom, there was this portal entry in the closet, uh, the wardrobe as they call it in the UK and other places. And me and my colleagues would uh, do what we call reptilian stakeouts where uh, me and a my lab buddy would we would flip a coin and uh, the winner would sleep on the bed and the loser would sleep in a sleeping bag on the floor and then the next night we'd alternate and on one occasion I woke up to find this large six foot tall plus reptilian very robust very large chest very large biceps very large muscles looming over me as I lay there, I was immobilized, and I tried to call out to my friend, but I, I couldn't even manifest a squeak. It was like the power of speaking had been taken from me momentarily. And this being radiated this negative energy, which, which I likened to uh, when some of the big cats in, in our world, when they emit a roar, the roar reverberates in the chest cavity of say a human being and effectively paralyzes the human being and then the tiger or whatever the case may be can then attack and devour the um, the person well these beings some of them they emit a very negative energy which makes one's skin crawl and which induces paralysis so i lay there for what seemed to be a long time while this thing was looming over me and what was interesting, I forgot to mention, was there was a group, there was a, also uh, three or four members of our team outside in, in the living room, sleeping in in, uh, in sleeping bags, and they didn't hear anything. Uh, this the second experience happened in February two thousand and thirteen, and I just gone to bed at night, and I pulled back the doona, got in the bed, and I've laid down now. At the time, I was sleeping, so the blinds were open and there was a street light and there's moon light that can come in so I can just, with all the activity going on, it's just so you can also, I could see if I wake up in the middle of the night, I've got some reference for what the hell's going on if it's in physical form and I didn't feel alone, all of a sudden I opened up my eyes and like about a foot and a half, two foot from my head on my right side was this huge eye and it was, I could tell it was yellow and there was a black slit pupil, like it, it had to have been about this big. And it was a little grey butt. So it was only like three, three and a half, it wasn't big. But the head on it was huge. And I could see, um, you know, the scales on it. And again, that was what the Elohim had projected to me, so I'm like, this ain't good. I, I wasn't freaking out. The eye freaked me out a bit, but I wasn't freaking out from it. It was the vibrate, like to me, vibration or how it resonated with me. I just didn't. Re it didn't resonate with me. Um, at, at this certain time, I closed my eyes and I started to. I just a thought came to me to. You know why am I judging it and to show it love that I didn't want it. Like, I guess the best way to explain it is I felt sorry for it being in the state that it was in. At which time it started to turn into like a... It started to look shocked. How I would have been looking at it, it started to look at me. And then all of a sudden it sort of turned into like a, a smoke, which I've got photos of how 
these beans can appear at certain times. That's what it turned into, like this smoky substance, and it disappeared. And for about a year, I didn't sleep in my room after that. I had to meditate till I went to sleep. On another occasion in that house, uh, there were different reptilians, uh, basically all of the same species, but in different stages of of maturation. And so there were immature reptoids, and we called them baby Godzillas, because when, like, the lady of the house and the children drew sketches, that's what came to me. They looked like little baby Godzillas. And one of these, at least one of these, was playing with a youngest daughter who was, like, oh, four years old at the time. They would play in that uh, children's bedroom uh, during the day, and... and the little reptoid was fascinated with the little girl's toys, in particular one toy that looked like a telephone and that had big keys for numbers and letters and when you pressed a, a given key it emitted a certain tone. So the lady of the house at odd times during the day when, uh, when only her little daughter was home would hear these tones coming out of the, the bedroom and on this one occasion the the little girl came out, and, and this little girl is now an adult. She has a child now. She said, Mom, me and my friend, you know, we're hungry, right? And so my friend humored the little girl. She walked back into the bedroom with uh, two platters with a slice of pizza on each one. When she walked into the bedroom, she noticed her daughter sitting in the install on the floor and alongside of her daughter was one of these little immature reptilian beings and they were playing with that toy making all these tones my friend was so startled she dropped both plates the reptilian made kind of a, like a, a pig kind of squealing sound and it fled into the closet and disappeared now me and uh, m my friend on another occasion we were sleeping in that room again. I was in the bed and he was on the floor and we began to hear, I began to hear noises coming out of the closet, right? So I sat bolt upright and I looked around and I was punched in the face, bang, bang on this cheek and on this cheek and I was knocked out and my, my cheeks ached for weeks thereafter. And I believe it was the little reptilian uh, it wasn't the big reptilian or rep big reptilians. It was one of the little ones. And it was just at the right height to punch me out. Uh, so I had a lot of experiences in that place. On another occasion, those reptilians followed me from that place in the high desert of Southern California to my house in San Diego, which is a good two and a half hour drive. And I had just driven back from the high desert settled down I was laying in bed reading and I fell asleep and sometime later I was rolled over in bed and I was jabbed at the base of my spine with an injection and as I was laid on my side I looked over and I saw what I at first thought was a very tall soldier in khaki uniform and then I saw something swishing around behind it Later on, in hindsight, I realized it was a very tall reptilian that just happened to be brownish khaki colored. Uh, because when I had time to think about it, the thing that was swishing around behind it was his tail. And it was interesting because those reptilians had told my friend, the lady of the house, that you know they were gonna get back at me basically for always going up there and you know, like I guess annoying them or something. So they followed me back to hundreds of miles you know, away to, to San Diego and they did this to me. And I developed the following day, I was working at, at ComNav Airpack in, in communications and my back was hurting me. I could feel a puncture wound at the base of my spine. I could feel it, uh, an injection mark. And I had a terrific headache. And I, I, I was sitting in the main office and there was an an annex, uh, uh, another office off to the left where uh, the lady who worked in there was on leave or something. So I went in to lay down there just to flatten out my back because my, my back hurt so much. Had a tremendous headache, 
was sweating profusely, uh, big time diarrhea, right? And what was interesting was I went to an emergency ward and I said that a lady, uh, the, the nurse who was checking me out, I said, this is gonna sound crazy, but last night I was rolled over on my side and some soldier, some military looking guy, very tall, like jabbed me at the base of my spine with a hypodermic needle. And she felt it, she said, yes, I, I see it. Um, you know, I, I don't doubt you at all, something happened. Uh, and then what was interesting was I, I called up my friend who was living in the high desert of Southern California and she told me her husband and her son had all come down with similar uh, symptoms after I had left. I, I've spoken a couple of times at this conference in St Anne's in Lancashire called Probe International and always something peculiar goes on there, right? Um, often on the way there as well and often on the way back too. Now, when I left to go up there, I went with a friend and I could, I knew that I had two etheric or ethereal bodyguards. They were reptilian, dressed in armor, and I, I have a few guardians, but this is, this is two that were with me big, powerful. So I knew that they, they were going with me for some reason, that they wouldn't have come for no reason. So anyway, I get to the conference and um, this guy comes up to us and he said, oh, would you and your mate take part in this uh, demonstration that I'm giving on the stage? I said, what is it? He said, well, what, what it is is transfiguration. Now, transfiguration is, you, you look at people, but you, I mean, I, I do it naturally anyway, but this is what he's telling people to do. You look at people and you look slightly out of focus to the side of them and you can see them turn into something else, okay? And he's doing this thing as a presentation. So he's got this huge white sheet or something up on the stage and he's asked a few people to stand up on the stage in the audience, you know, to see if they can see anything with that person or if they change into, into somebody. So I'm up on the stage and uh, people are calling out the audience, I can see so and so, so and so, and so, and so. And this woman shouts out, that guy in the white shirt, which is very funny. <laughs> that guy in the white shirt, he's got two huge reptilians each side of him. <laughs> You've seen them? Oh, I'd just taken my mum and a couple of friends out to go and see the crafts. I got told basically earlier that day that the, the crafts would be about, that I could take mum out there to show her, and mum hadn't seen anything up to that point. Um, and it got to a certain point in the night where a craft that came down that low, just basically above gum tree height, about the size of a house. And mum ran to the car door and she tried to open up the car and she's like, we've got to go home. She freaked her out, she thought they were going to land. So I said, no, you've got to see this stuff because I know you believe me, but you've now, you're definitely going to have something to go by, you know, but I needed her to see this and, and go, all right, this shit's, you know, this, this stuff's for real. So um, we went back into town at that point, because she freaked out, dropped her off and another friend, and my friend who was staying with me at the time, Carol, who came to visit, we decided we'll go back out. Now, at that time at home, she got a thought that we shouldn't be going back out, and so did I, but we didn't say something, say anything to one another, which later on I said, if it needs to happen again, let, you know, let's tell each other. So we drive back out of town to where we are seeing the crafts, or where I told to go, and as soon as I got out of the car, she got out of the car too, and we walked around to the back of the four-wheel drive to get out the equipment, and as soon as I'm turning to, to pull up the back of the, the boot, there was one of the Draco reptilians 
to, it was basically behind Carol on an angle. Now, at this time, it was phasing in and out like a, dist uh, like a distortion, how would you say? It was sort of be like a hologram tuning in and out with static. And it was coming in and out. And straight away, I just said to her, get in the car. I got into the car. At that time, um, like this would have only been 10 metres away. And it had horns, it's got the wings. I couldn't tell you what colour, but when they were projected to me, they were yellowish brown colour. Big, like maybe eight, nine foot tall, something like It was big, but it was only 10 metres away. And in the distance, maybe 150 metres away, is a street light out there. It's the only light in the whole area because it's out of town in a swimming area, like where people take their boats and their kids and have picnics. So because of that, I sort of had a good reference to see it. Even though, you know, usually you can see stuff with the shadow dudes in the dark, you can still get something. But when we hopped in the car at this time, the lights on the interior, on the, on the speedo, on the dashboard, and the outside lights all turned on at different times. They were all, you know, it was like a disco of lights. No reason for, for it to be happening. And I'm trying to turn on the car, and after some time, I just sort of blasted it with love in my mind anyway. And it got a little bit more intense, and then I did it again. Then all of a sudden, like in my mind, it's just like, just start the car. And the car started at that time, so I've reversed out, floored it out of there, and got on my way. Now, I haven't got, you know, really messages from the reptilians or anything like that. They seem to have been put in my way, and it's like I'm a beacon for them in some ways, because once you, I think you're awakened to a certain point, things will come through and they'll pick up on your thoughts. So they're the three experiences I've had with reptilians. One incident that I haven't told many people about was just about three, maybe four years ago, I went to Australia and I went through Heathrow and almost everybody in this, well, not almost everybody, lots of people it, Heathrow was shape-shifting. There were reptilians walking around everywhere, right? Now, some of this can be you decoding something about their aura, but other times it can be you're decoding what is really there rather than what their emotions are um, projecting. But, and I've had that instance in Macquarie Shopping Centre in Sydney as well, where nearly everybody there is looking like a well, is, is a reptilian and, and full on and they're much taller than they are as humans and they're much bigger and much more powerful looking and big tails and all the rest of it. But full on it is and um, but anyway this Heathrow thing. Um, I got on the plane and they swapped my seat for some reason and I sat down in this other seat and I noticed there was an Indian lady in the sari and everything sitting there and she was looking at me intently like that. But her eyes were really lovely. She was really kind of, you could tell it was, a, it was really loving whatever she was doing, you know, but she was doing something. I saw this guy in the seat in front of me just to look along. He rose up and turned into this huge reptilian, really aggressive. This air hostess came to me, uh, and this don't happen, does it? She, she knelt down next to me, she put her hand on my knee, and she was going, we're gonna look after you, everything will be all right. And then this Indian lady, I heard this voice in my mind and it was definitely coming from her. And she said, you are a golden child and very special. We are looking after you. And I thought, what's a golden child? Well, I don't know. <laughs> that's, what, so you're happy, isn't it? that's what she said. Yeah, maybe, I don't know. On another occasion, I, myself and a, a female MyLab friend were abducted together and we were brought to an underground base in the high desert of Southern California, once again in, in the, the Victorville Barstow area. And we were confronted by what appeared to us to be three military uh, people. 
Again, one of them was taller than the other two. The one that was the tallest was standing behind a lectern or a podium. And it was quite tall. And it, it was yelling at my friend and I. We were kind of made to stand at attention uh, several feet away from these three beings. They appeared as military personnel with the short hair, et cetera, et cetera. But one of them was in the guise of a high-ranking officer, and the high-ranking officer was irate. Uh, it was screaming at us, yelling at us, what are we doing? Like, how do we know so much, right? Uh, and I knew immediately that this tall being was not a human. I knew that it was really a reptilian because they often assume the guise of military personnel. Sometimes uh, these abductees in my labs in the underground bases can, can look at a, what's supposed to be a military person but notice that they have vertical pupils or notice that they don't communicate much and once in a while they growl or they hiss or they do something to give themselves away. And while this tall general or this tall officer was berating the both of us, I looked at my friend and I said, this is not a dream, this is real. We're having a real experience here, so remember this, right? And then the, the being, uh, the assumed supposed military guy just kept yelling at us, eventually they sent us back. The reptilian symbology, which is common in the folkloric traditions of, of countless cultures throughout the planet and throughout history, uh, is not so much a metaphor or an archetype as it is a, a way to describe the existence of these, these beings, that they really have existed all this time and that they've played a role in the development of civilization, that they've uh, intervened at critical points in, in human history. So this is why we, we are constantly bombarded with, with reptile, symbology, serpent symbology, dragons, and so forth. It, it's not to do with any archetype or metaphor. It has to do with the existence of these beings and the occulted uh, knowledge going way back that these beings are here and, and they've been involved with us all along. One of the important things throughout all of their interaction with humanity was not to be recognized and not to be seen because humans record. Humans record in stone. We're very good at that. We create. We're fantastic like that as a race. So they, they, they recreate, and the reptilians didn't want that. Um, you will see it occasionally in some of the um, Sumerian or Assyrian Babylonian carvings, occasionally. You will also see it in some of the Mayan or Aztec uh, items. What you're much more likely to see are, are renditions of feline species from, from the Egyptian times because they weren't covered by the same protocol. So they weren't, um, there was no ban on um, depicting them, whereas there is a ban, there still is now a ban on depicting reptilians, and I'll give you uh, absolute proof of that. When I did that very nice interview on the uh, Today program with Holly Willoughby and Schofield, and I did two drawings, one of uh, a mantid and one of a reptile, and I was told point blank, we're not allowed to put the reptile up because they were going to have me as a backdrop, uh, them as a backdrop to me. So uh, the stills I've got, which they very kindly sent me, is now I'm being interviewed with them, and behind me is a picture of the mantid. But originally, Schofield and gang were going to have the mantid and the reptile, and somebody very high up said, we're not allowed. They didn't even know what it was called. All they said to me was, we've been told we can't put this one up. So there's a, a, a blanket that goes out, and hence, if you think about what your title of this DVD is, because we're coming around to that now, and you think about that chapter in The Greatest Secret that David Icke wrote, which was don't mention the reptiles. And that's, that's a fact, and David's absolutely right, that the, the system doesn't want to publicize them because they have signed an agreement not to publicize them. It's to keep them out. So you can talk about the greys as much as you want. That's not an issue. You can talk about the mantid as much as you want because they don't manipulate humanity. The reptile race that we're talking about manipulates humanity and has done for thousands of years and has a covenant with the elite humans who run the world that they will always be in the shadows.
You're awfully quiet, John. I feel a little underwhelmed for a man who asks questions for a living. I got a million questions. But let's start with my boss. Is he... <laughs> John, what if a man's thoughts were not his own? What if certain men and women were pliable, manageable, accessible? Accessible? Manageable? You mean controlled? There are levels of control, John. Depending on the situation. This situation required a little show and tell. Others are a little more intrusive. Behind the scenes, deals were done, but they weren't necessarily beneficial to the populace. In modern times, phase one has always been to make you aware of our presence. Over time, we could gain acceptance through the use of literature, religion, music, movies. If, if you um, look at two themes of movies um, in recent times, and, and some of them not so recent times, but there is there's a big theme now, and I don't go to the movies very much because um, it's all bloody violence and, and stuff like that most of the time, but, but if it's for my research, I'll, I'll obviously go. Um, one is a, a, a kind of a reptilian theme that you pick up, and the other one is, you know, many times incorporated into the reptilian theme and, and in alien invasions um, is a well beyond Orwellian society um, where humans are under total control of a vicious police state and a tiny elite. As far as movies and media being possible leaks to the truth about non-humans or in particular the reptilians, uh, I think this is certainly possible and I think that there are several movies that stand out in my mind as being movies that might be leaks. Well, in particular, Stanley Kubrick's Eyes Wide Shut, for which I think that he was murdered. Uh, he was warned not to publish it and he said, to heck with you, and he was killed shortly after the release of the movie. And uh, also, uh, Rosemary's Baby um, shows a even a reptilian kind of baby at the end of the movie. And uh, that those kind of movies seem to be kind of more realistic um, leaks, if you were. And then you have John Carpenter's They Live and The Thing and Aliens, which I think are all possible relevant um, information or visions, you might say, inspirations for what's really happening. I think if you look at John Carpenter, the creator of They Live, if you look at his movie making history, which includes Satanism and, and, and horror and what have you, this guy um, has at least some knowledge of what's happening. And I, I had to laugh. Um, I said this in a book once, years ago. And someone wrote to John Carpenter saying what I'd said. And um, he wrote back to him, I saw the letter, saying, no, um, the, the, uh, it wasn't. The, um, the, the aliens, you know, in, inside the people, um, I, I, I was um, symbolizing the uh, Republicans. And you go, yeah, John, all right. Yeah, OK, you were, yeah. I mean, I mean anyone who's seen They Live will laugh at that. And I watched They Live. Um, about four or five years ago, I think, on the internet, it was on YouTube, and I watched it on there. Um, now that is so real. What I found in life is that very often the things that are kind of I find distressing or, or are distressing for me at the time, I don't watch. I'm, I don't know why, but I don't watch. People say, "Oh, you should watch this," and I don't. 
And then some, uh, it comes to a point where I feel that, yeah, okay, I'll watch that or I'll read that. And, and I will. And then I know why it was I didn't watch it before. I wasn't ready to sort of integrate that into where I was at the time. But V and They Live are so accurate. So, so accurate. Um, they Live. It's classic. Uh, and, and that time back too where you have a small number of people who are actually um, not what they seem. They look human to people of everyday life, but when the guy put the sunglasses on that allowed him to decode reality on another level, that was the symbolism of it, he saw that they actually, behind the human form, they weren't human at all. And they were the people in power. They were the bankers, they were the politicians, they were the president. They were some of the police. Uh, and um, also, when he put the glasses on, uh, on that subliminal level, he could see all the subliminal messages um, all around him, um, telling him to, to stay asleep, to not question, to obey authority. And it was a, a, a movie, it was kind of a B movie, wasn't it? A kind of, lot, most people would never have heard of. And yet, it was way ahead of its time in portraying the world that we're actually living in. The Super Mario Brothers, if anyone gets a chance to see that movie, it, it's amazing. Uh, in the old video days, video store days, you would find this movie in, in the, child, the children's section. The story starts out with a celestially driven cataclysm. An asteroid comes and wipes out the dinosaurs and through some kind of weird kind of alchemical process, <clears throat> an alternate reality is created where the survivors of uh, the reptile survivors of the surface went underground into an alternate dimension and they became the rulers and they were shapeshifters. They were shapeshift between human and reptilian. The head reptile was Dennis Hopper, if, if you've ever seen that movie. And uh, it was another dimension that was parallel to our dimension. And it had to do with bloodlines, it had to do with all kinds of stuff. And of course, the protag protagonists, Luigi and Mario, you know, they defeat the reptilians, right? Very interesting story. When I was growing up in the 70s, a TV show that I really loved was Land of the Lost. It involved a pocket universe where dinosaurs lived and advanced beings who turned out to be the ancestors of these primitive slea stacks had built these pylons, which were devices used for interdimensional travel and time travel, as well as such things as regulating the weather in the Land of the Lost. But the slea stacks, uh, which the the, the advanced beings, they called them the altrusians, eventually evolved into were like barbaric, uh, kind of vaguely reptilian beings that lived underground. They were very tall and menacing, but there are some definite parallels between the, the storylines in the Land of the Lost and uh, the research on re under, reptilians living underground and being able to travel through portals and so forth. Last year, the movie came out, Ender's Game, a wonderful story about how we're assuming that these, um, that these, these, these inhuman insectoid ETs are somehow hostile and dangerous to us just because we've got this mindset of, of, of fighting everything out there that moves. And, and actually they're not. Um, this, is, uh, this is not what they're trying to do at all. And again, it takes a little kid to have the wisdom to actually, to actually, um, discern what's really happening here. You know, another show that I'm, I'm fascinated with is Thundercats. I've only watched a few episodes of that, but but it, again, it deals with these feline aliens that are battling the reptilians. And uh, all these different races allied with the reptilians. There's canine beings, there's wolf beings, there's bird beings. Uh, some are aligned on one, one side or the other and some want to be neutral. And, and many of these different ET races are depicted in the Thundercats cartoon. Fascinating. I wish I'd seen it when I was younger. Uh, another show is, is V. The original V that, that shows these human-looking aliens coming in huge craft, 
but in reality, they're reptilians, and they eventually can gain control of politics, the media, and everything else. And and uh, and then a small band of uh, of resistance fighters develops, led by a woman. And there's there's a lot of metaphorical, metaphysical truth behind that because some of the best spiritual warriors I've found are women. They're heart centered. They have all these abilities. They don't operate from a place of ego, and they don't need accolades. They don't need fame or fortune. They they tend to operate. The real players tend to operate on their own under the radar, and many of them are women. So when I see this TV show V, and it's led by a, a woman scientist or something, if my memory serves, that really that really resonated with me. You, you, you've got to start immediately with 2001: The Space Odyssey. That's how you'd start, and then you would do the original Star Trek, um, because Gene Rodenberry. Um, not only went out and found uh, contactees, but he actually joined a circle of people who were channeling uh, other entities. So these people either, as directors or producers, either have direct knowledge, or more likely it's a give and take with the, the security services. Um, the security service will say, okay, you've done us a favor, here's an idea. It's not really an idea, it's something they know, but they're to run with the idea. Uh, where it's become insidious, and that's why I'm a bit unwilling to, to, to help you out with this too much, is because they will um, use the, the media to play out an agenda for them to test its reaction on the audience. And the first time that occurred was in <clears throat> 1938. Was it 38 when Orson Welles did his War of the Worlds? What people don't know was that was all orchestrated to, 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 to early sort of um, focus groups to feed back on what the situation was. Now, it actually wasn't panic, as the media was, was told. There was only a small pocket of panic, but they wanted to create panic, so that's why all the mainstream media said there was mass panic, because that was the argument, that's why we're not gonna go public with what's happening. What is happening, I would suggest, is that subconsciously, because there are so many with the same theme, it's laughable. Subconsciously, the human mind is being made familiar with something that if it wasn't made familiar with subconsciously in this way, when it is revealed, people would be in a massive, massive state of, of shock, whereas they're bringing it in slowly. So what they're doing is that on one level, they are preparing people to be familiar with and therefore be far more likely to accept without resistance the very Orwellian society that's being brought in by these reptilian hybrid bloodlines because this archontic force has been working to manipulate human society uh, over these what we call in our version of time thousands and thousands of years to reach this point where they can take the whole thing over. Um, and turn humans into a slave race. Now, this is interesting, um, given what I, I talked about in terms of this archontic reptilian force cannot create itself. It has to um, piggyback that which is already created. It cannot create the Orwellian society. It has to manipulate us to do it. They have to let us know what they're doing or what they're going to do before they do it. It's kind of like a rule of the game from their point of view. And if you see it this way, it gets them off the karmic hook. What I mean by that is that if I were to tell you, the viewer watching this now, that I intended to, to burgle their house, tonight and I was going to do it by climbing in this window at two o'clock in the morning and this is what I was going to go and steal and if I told them that and they didn't believe me and they took no action and I went and did it anyway then I would be off the karmic hook because it's their fault for not securing the window latch it's their fault for not standing there with a gun waiting for me to come. It's their fault for not taking me seriously. It's like, well, I told you, and it happened, so now the responsibility is yours, not mine. 
media nowadays, major, major Hollywood films, are used to push an ideal which is either part of a programming agenda or it's an agenda to test out what the reaction is on the public. Um, any decent uh, producer in Hollywood who's doing a science fiction or science fantasy film now will be heavily involved with the secret government or the secret service, whatever we want to call them, um, for a give and take an exchange of ideas. If you look at Stanley Kubrick, Stanley Kubrick made his own deal that he could make as many films as he wanted and have oversight over it, providing he never told the truth about the supposed moon landings. And as soon as he broke that agreement, they killed him. So right through history for Hollywood, Hollywood is an integral arm of manipulation, mind control, and just um, focus grouping, just testing. So anyone who, who has an interest will look at a film and say, well, I look at that, look at that. I think someone has made an effort to enlighten the people so they really know what's going on, whether it's done for malign in-your-face purposes or it's done, at least some of it is done, to wake people up. Who knows? But I do know that this process is ongoing. There are a whole bunch of different possible agendas going on with the sewing of these concepts in Hollywood. But to condense everything down into one into one short sentence. This is no accident. It's certainly planned. So what? This is an invasion. Take over the planet, kill everyone. Then what? If it was up to certain members of our community, yes. But it's a little more complicated than that, John. Plus, we've been there, done that. Wasn't pretty. I look at it more as a occupation. I know you guys are fond of that. How is this possible? I mean, what about the government? What about our military? <laughs> what about... They work for us, John. We run the show. It's all an illusion. Nothing you experience here is real. Nothing. None of it. At least not in the way you think it is. Oh, it's a work of genius, John. Even after all this time, and we're talking a lot of time. I'm a maniac. The complexity of the plan still impresses the hell out of me. Yeah. I'm sorry? The answer to your question is yes. <laughs> you are about to ask me about the little gray guys in your room as a kid. You know, the little guys, big eyes, all serious and cold. Ooh, creepy little things. Yeah, they work for us, John. And you. And them. John, do you play chess? Haven't we played enough games? Well, if this were a game of chess, I'd be a knight. Our little gray friends would be the pawns. And me? What piece am I in your game? <laughs> That's just it, John. You're not even in the game. But I'm here to change that. I don't understand. Why are you here? What do you want? What do we want? Where did we come from? When did we get here? That's a good question. Mm -hmm.